The guitar is an ancient Mediterranean instrument, accompanying a voice or singing alone since ancient times. Through the Renaissance, Spain was the primary source of guitars. In the 19th century, the foremost creator of guitars in the United States was Orville Gibson, whose legacy is carried on with the Gibson guitar name. In every time period, the limitation of the guitar was volume. The guitar was ideally suited to accompany a single voice and could blend nicely in a trio, but its sound disappeared in a larger group. That meant that it could play only one role in a larger group, a supporting role driving the rhythm with multi-string chords. Even then, to maximize the volume, the guitar was constructed with an arched top and played flat across an open lap formed by crossed legs. In the 30s and the 40s, every big band had a rhythm guitar player, and it was an essential part of basically the sound of the big band. There's no question that the rhythm guitarist was a key member of the big band, and orchestras of the 30s and 40s all had rhythm guitarists who were famous in their own right. Count Basie had Freddie Green, Ray Noble had Alan Roos, and Benny Goodman had George Van Epps. Down the musical road, the steel guitar was invading from Hawaii and becoming a mandatory member of Texas string bands playing western swing music in the 20s and 30s. Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys was perhaps the most well-known of the western swing orchestras. Simple amplification with a freestanding microphone helped most instruments find a louder voice, but that did not work with the guitar because the sound was already being amplified within the instrument. Microphones distorted the doubly amplified sound. Lloyd Loire moved the guitar to the next level when he floated the fingerboard, added a supplemental soundboard, patented an electrostatic pickup, and experimented with an electric double bass and an electromagnetic pickup. Even though his ideas did not result in new products, they pushed development along at Gibson. However, the electrification of the guitar with a pickup wasn't initially successful because of the feedback. Feedback occurred because the pickup was too close to the vibrating strings. Uh, the humbucker is basically two single coils and combining them together, it eliminates the 60 cycle hum that a single coil pickup has and that also adds to the overdrive that you can, you can get on a guitar. In Waukesha, Wisconsin, one magnificent guitarist and his wife were experimenting with amplification and recording to layer the sound of the guitar with memorable and unique results. This unique layered sound became the signature of musical innovator Les Paul. Les Paul started electrifying his acoustic guitar because he was playing on street corners in Waukesha and he was drawing large crowds and the people in the back couldn't hear it. He found the physical limitations of the guitar frustrating and experimented constantly to find ways to overcome those limitations. His first attempt at a solid body guitar was known as a log. That became the Gibson Les Paul model. On the west coast there was a radio repairman, Leo Fender. He was by nature a tinkerer, and as with the best of tinkerers, he was continually inventing things. He was asked by a variety of musician friends to develop an electric guitar. His first attempt at a solid body guitar was known as the plank. During World War II, California musicians came to his radio shop to rent the only available electric guitar. Prior to Fender, there was no mass produced solid body electric guitar. Benny Goodman took the big band to the next level when he added an electric guitar played by the brilliant innovator Charlie Christian. The electric guitar meant that a group much smaller and cheaper than a big band could achieve a sound that was just as loud, filling much larger venues in the same group with an acoustic guitar. The economics of the electric guitar made its rapid adoption by performers inevitable. But even a small combo using an electric guitar still had a logistics problem, transporting and handling the massive upright bass. So Leo developed an electric bass. A bass player could be heard, but it could also be portable. But he wouldn't have done that if he didn't have bass players telling him, you know, I need a bass. As the new instruments were being developed, the new music was developing too. 
Rhythm and blues, formerly limited to black performers and black audiences, began to reach white audiences. White artists began to record covers of black music. Memphis DJ Dewey Phillips became the first white DJ playing all black music, and that was two years before Alan Free took the credit for discovering rock and roll. What was the world's reaction to the revolution caused by the electric guitar? As with all new styles of music and new instruments, the previous generations found the music created on electric guitars to be terrifying, corrupting, and ugly. Robert Meredith Wilson called this new music that rape of the blues, that mewling, babbling destroyer of craftsmanship, that scaly corrupter of taste. Frank Sinatra wrote that the new sound was the most brutal, ugly, degenerate, vicious form of expression and has been my displeasure to hear. It fosters almost totally negative and destructive reactions in young people. It manages to be the martial music of every sideburn delinquent on the face of the earth. Mitch Miller, the first true record producer, called the music of the electric guitar the glorification of monotony, musical baby food. It's not music. It's a disease. It seems to encourage sloppy clothes. It's one step from fascism. In 1954, the black newspaper, the New York Age Defender, thought that DJ Alan Freed was setting New York and the entire eastern seaboard on fire by constantly airing rhythm and blues records and doing a fine race relations job. Freed's popularity was forcing white disc jockeys who had never played rhythm and blues records on the air to play them, and forcing white record shops to stock them. In 1956, Asbury Park, Jersey City, San Jose, Santa Cruz, and San Antonio banned rock and roll from dance halls, public buildings, and city pools for fear that the disruptive rhythms of the electric guitar would attract undesirable elements. In 1958, DJ Alan Freed was indicted for inciting a riot outside an arena in Boston by playing rock and roll music. Nine men and six women required hospital treatment. That same year, St. Louis radio station KWK banned all rock and roll, smashing every rock and roll record in the station library. Although it comes as no surprise that various songs were banned for violent, drug, or sexual content, the instrumental Rumble by Link Ray was banned in 1959 for fear it would incite teen violence. Several British dance halls banned the Dave Clark Five's hit Bits and Pieces in 1964 for fear that Lenny Davidson's driving guitar would result in damage to wooden dance floors from stomping teenagers. Jimi Hendrix used his extraordinary talents with the electric guitar to create his feedback-filled version of the Star-Spangled Banner in 1970. In disgusted response, Georgia Governor Lester Maddox sought legislation banning all rock festivals. It wasn't until 1979 that San Francisco lifted its ban on electric instruments in Golden Gate Park. Since the very birth of rock and roll, the sound of electric guitar has defined contemporary music. The briefest of guitar riffs makes the anthems of each decade immediately recognizable. Chuck Berry! The creation of the electric guitar caused a revolution in American music. The reaction to the electric guitar changed the way people use music as a major factor in achieving social change and to express rebellion and resistance. The new voice of the electric guitar became the symbol of cultural revolution. 